If you're tired of these promos, supporters get the podcast early and ad-free. Just go to donate.bogosity.tv for the links to sign up. Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the week of December 13, 2020. The podcast that's all out of luck. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's denormalize the news of the bogus. So you remember the Hunter Biden scandal that cropped up just before the election? The one we got slammed for covering? The one everyone else insisted was fake, even though the digital signatures on the emails verified they were genuine, as well as statements from the other parties to the emails? The one that the news media declared to be fake and Russian propaganda and deleted all the stories about it that people shared and banned all the people who shared it? Well, guess what? Hunter Biden has now admitted he's under investigation by federal prosecutors in Delaware. He claimed it was merely about tax affairs, but although those would be damning enough, there's a lot more to the investigation than that. He is also being investigated by the Securities Fraud Unit in the Southern District of New York. Investigators in Delaware and Washington are also looking into money laundering and ties to foreign nations. Among the worst of them are his position on the board of Ukrainian energy company Burisma, a position for which he had no education or experience, and his deals with Chinese oil magnate Ye Jianming. Hunter Biden's contact at the oil company, Patrick Ho, was convicted in 2018 of attempts to bribe government officials in Chad and Uganda. Another of Hunter's business partners, Devin Archer, was convicted that same year on fraud charges. There are a lot more which you can read about in this Politico article linked in the show notes. Joe Biden has previously denied any awareness of his son's misdeeds, even though they've all been linked to abuses of power the elder Biden committed on Hunter's behalf. But when this information was released, Biden's transition team issued a non-statement saying, quote, President-elect Biden is deeply proud of his son, who has fought through difficult challenges, including the vicious personal attacks of recent months, only to emerge stronger. But that's not really the big point here. The point is that previously outlets like Politico were calling the story Russian disinformation, as the second Politico link from back in October says. Yes, the exact same news site. They wrote... While there has been no immediate indication of Russian involvement in the release of emails the Post obtained, its general thrust mirrors a narrative that U.S. intelligence agencies have described as part of an active Russian disinformation effort aimed at denigrating Biden's candidacy. Does that sound like confession through projection to anyone? In either event, now we have absolute proof of what we've suspected all along. The news media have been deliberately working against the American people to empower corrupt politicians such as Joe Biden. They needed to get Biden nominated over several other much better qualified individuals, and they needed him to be elected over Donald Trump. And then they wonder why so many of us are skeptical of the election shenanigans, even those of us who aren't in any way Trump fans. Senator Tom Cotton has called for special counsel since Biden is said to become president next month. Quote, These investigations span multiple jurisdictions, and if Joe Biden becomes president, then all of those prosecutors are in line to be fired next month. If there were ever circumstances that created a conflict of interest and called for a special counsel, I think those circumstances are present here. The Biden family has been trading on Joe Biden's public office for 50 years. Do we really think that will change if Joe Biden becomes president, the highest office in the land? Let's hope we can get the facts about this, But it'll be interesting to see how differently the news media treats this investigation compared to the transparently bogus Russia 2016 election interference they wasted three years trying to support and came up completely empty. If you're looking for ways to support this channel, but you don't have any spare cash and you can't stand advertisements, you can do so by generating your own cryptocurrency. Use the links at the bottom of the description to listen to the podcast and all of my videos on bittube.tv or lbry.tv to get cryptocurrency for the creator and yourself. Or if you listen to the podcast at the podcast page, you'll also generate crypto.
You can also go to airtime.bogosity.tv to get the airtime extension and generate crypto for yourself and the creators on the web anywhere you go, including my YouTube channel. Get five tubes free just for installing the extension and signing up, and then simply browse the web as normal. Easily monetize your favorite creators and yourself with cryptocurrency without advertising on BitTube.tv or LBRY.tv or with the Airtime extension at Airtime.Pagosity.tv. So here's another example like we've seen before of California driving away their best and brightest with high taxation. This time it's Elon Musk. He's moved his private foundation to Austin, Texas, and is building a new truck and SUV factory for Tesla. Musk's Space Exploration Technologies Corporation already has two locations in Austin. A lot of SpaceX's facilities are in Texas as well. The Musk Foundation's assets are almost $329 million according to tax filings, and it's dedicated to renewable energy and advocacy, human space exploration, pediatric research, science and engineering education, and research and development into safe artificial intelligence to benefit humanity. So what does that mean for Musk himself? Tax attorney Christopher Maine says it's really complicated to determine whether or not someone's a California resident for tax purposes. He said, quote, if a great deal of income is at stake, a prudent taxpayer might want to eliminate all contacts with California as much as possible, and relocating their foundation might be one of them. Despite living in the LA area for more than 20 years, he's been spending more and more time in Texas, and he's reportedly told friends that he's moving to Austin. The speculation is, it looks like Musk might be looking to make Texas his permanent place of residence. The move may be fueled by more than taxes. Musk famously defied ridiculous rules passed by Alameda County ordering shutdowns of production early in the COVID epidemic. Musk, a COVID survivor himself, threatened to move facilities to Texas or Nevada. California just keeps showing us how big government and socialism plants the seeds for its own destruction. The only question is, are they going to take the rest of us down with them? If you're on the Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or hotel, anyone on that network can get your traffic. Do you really trust all of those strangers? For that matter, do you really trust your ISP? A VPN can protect you from prying eyes, disguise your location, and even foil government sensors. It's essential in this day and age. So go to vpn.pagosity.tv and you'll be taken to BoxPN. Starting at just $2.99 a month, you can get unlimited high-speed connections to VPN servers all over the world. And they don't log connections, so your privacy is assured. Traveling abroad, just VPN home. And don't worry about what those other governments are doing. Back at home, stop your ISP from traffic shaping and messing with the quality internet access you're paying good money for. You can connect from multiple machines at once, including your smartphone or tablet, and it supports all the secure standards, including OpenVPN and SSTP. Bypass sensors and surveillance with your own secure VPN connection. Go to vpn.pagosity.tv. So we've talked a lot about the DMCA. There are currently two fights in Congress over portions of it. One is over the Section 512 takedowns on the web we're all too familiar with, and the other is Section 1201, covering reverse engineering. We've talked about the latter, too, and how it weakens cybersecurity, and Errata Security's Robert Graham has an excellent write-up on it. He mentions Kirchhoff's principle, which basically says that to make a secure protocol, you release publicly everything about how it works, except the encryption key used to make the demonstration ciphertext, so security professionals can analyze it properly. They need all the details about the algorithm and its functioning to do so. Graham writes, Only through making details public can security flaws be found, discussed, and fixed. This includes reverse engineering to search for flaws. Cybersecurity experts have long struggled against the ignorant who hold the naive belief that we should instead cover up information so that evildoers cannot find and exploit flaws. Surely, they believe, giving just anybody access to critical details of our security weakens it. The ignorant have little faith in technology that it can be made more secure. They have more faith in government's ability to control information. This is so often described derisively as security through obscurity, and as we've covered so many times, it doesn't work. 
As Graham points out, especially when it's combined with legislation like Section 1201, really, you're just making it impossible to notice security flaws until after they're exploited. Quote, It seems counterintuitive that revealing your encryption algorithms to your enemy is the best way to secure them, but history has proven time and time again that this is indeed true. Encryption algorithms your enemy cannot see are insecure. The same is true of the rest of cybersecurity. But, he writes, In the year 1998, ignorance prevailed with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Section 1201 makes reverse engineering illegal. It attempts to secure copyright not through strong technological means, but by the heavy hand of government punishment. The main problem, as we've discussed, is that it's mostly trying to protect DRM, which cannot be made secure since all of the information on how to decrypt a song or movie needs to be sent to the user's machine in order for them to play it, they're also sending the information needed to decrypt it, because those are one and the same. You can't play it without decrypting it first. Yet, unlike most encryption, which tries to stop the prying eyes of third parties, DRM attempts to stop the user himself from copying the content that he's just been given all the information for on how to copy it. Graham goes into the exemptions that were made for security testing and their flaws, the biggest being that it expires every three years. So every three years, they have to fight to get the exceptions back in the list, and each time they do, it's been changed, and so no one knows what's allowed or will be allowed, and this creates a chilling effect on permissible research. Graham writes, You can understand the nature of the debate by looking at those on each side. Those lobbying for the exceptions are those trying to make technology more secure, such as Rabbit7, BugCrowd, DOA Security, Luda Security, and HackerOne. Those organizations have no interest in violating copyright. Their only concern is cybersecurity, finding and fixing flaws. He mentions the opposing side including the copyright industry wanting to protect the DRM encryption on DVD and Blu-ray discs, even though those were broken years ago, but more insidiously, he mentions that some of them have nothing at all to do with copyright. Quote, This notably includes the three major voting machine suppliers in the United States, Dominion Voting, ESNS, and Hart InterCivic. Security professionals have been pointing out security flaws in their equipment for the past several years. These vendors are explicitly trying to cover up their security flaws by using the law to silence critics. In their opposition to the latest three-year exemption, they wrote, The federal government already has ways of ensuring election system security through programs conducted by the EAC and DHS. These programs, in combination with testing done in partnership between system providers, independent voting system test labs, and election officials, provide a high degree of confidence that election systems are secure and can be used to run fair and accurate elections, giving anonymous hackers a license to attack critical infrastructure would not serve the public interest. The main response most cybersecurity professionals have to that is... It's a blatant violation of Kirchhoff's principle. And as we've covered each year at DEF CON, these machines repeatedly get hacked, including one year by teenagers. All of them hacked, all of them certified as secure by state and federal governments. And again, people wonder why we're skeptical about all these election shenanigans. This is not how the top tech companies behave. Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, they've all gotten over their childish embarrassment at people pointing out that they might have made a mistake with their wonderful oh-so-perfect code and taken a much more humble policy of welcoming people who find security flaws and even paying for them with bug bounties. None of the voting machine companies do this. And the other big point is that you do not want to limit this stuff to formal research. Quote, it's important to understand that the security research we are talking about is always ad hoc rather than formal. These companies already do formal research and development. They invest billions of dollars in securing their technology. But no matter how much formal research they do, informal poking around by users, hobbyists, and hackers still finds unexpected things. This ad hoc nature is important when looking at the solution to the problem. Many think this can be formalized, such as with the requirement of contacting a company asking for permission to look at their product before doing any reverse engineering. This doesn't work. It's the same as with everything else that preaches openness and transparency. 
Imagine if we had freedom of the press, but only for journalists who first were licensed by the government. Imagine if there were freedom of religion, but only for churches officially designated by the government. Of course, if you look at what's going on, we kind of have both of those right now, but at any rate, something that's a lot more relevant to the news, it should apply to elections themselves. And I don't just mean the cybersecurity of the voting machines. I mean everything about the voting process. Voter verification, signature verification, counting the ballots, ballot watchers, all of it should be completely transparent. And as is the case with cybersecurity, I'm very wary of those who don't want the election to be transparent and open to review. This all goes back to Shannon's maxim. One ought to design systems under the assumption that the enemy will immediately gain full familiarity with them. Anyone who is capable of figuring out how an insecure system works can figure out how to compromise it. With a secure system, it doesn't matter. Errors are prevented or caught, no matter how much someone tries to cheat. Do you have children, or nieces or nephews? Are you homeschooling, or just want to counter some of the socialist indoctrination most children get in school? If so, go to bogosity.tv slash Tuttle Twins, and you'll be taken to a website where you can get some great books for elementary age children. The Tuttle Twins books are books about liberty and free market economics that include children's versions of Bastiat's The Law, Leonard Reed's I Pencil, and Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, as well as books about the Federal Reserve and how regulations protect business cronies. They'll learn about the harm caused by eminent domain, or regulations passed in the name of safety, and fundamental concepts of liberty. And as you can see from the sample pages on the website, they're all easy to read and nicely illustrated. They're just $9.99 a piece, or get a special discount as well as free bonuses when you purchase all five. You can even buy in bulk to donate to schools and local libraries. So get the Tuttle Twins books at bogosity.tv slash Tuttle Twins. And now it's time to epigrammatize this week's biggest bogan emitter. And this week it goes to the Federal Trade Commission, who is working with a coalition of 48 state attorneys general in an antitrust action against the horrible monopoly Facebook. They accuse Facebook of preventing alternatives from rising up. But Facebook weren't the ones who, for example, stopped the rise of Gab.ai, saying that it was a site for neo-Nazis, white supremacists, the alt-right, and all sorts of mean, nasty, ugly things, resulting in it being dropped by its hosting provider, its extensions removed from all the browser stores, and debanked from PayPal, Coinbase, Square, and Stripe. Just saying, kind of hard to make an alternative when that keeps happening. We've covered over and over again why it's bogus to call Facebook a monopoly, but they've just added a new whopper to the list. Quote, Facebook has engaged in a systematic strategy, including its 2012 acquisition of up-and-coming rival Instagram, its 2014 acquisition of the mobile messaging app WhatsApp, and the imposition of anti-competitive conditions on software developers to eliminate threats to its monopoly. They want to rescind the acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp and require the company to seek prior notice and approval for all future mergers and acquisitions. The problem is, those mergers were approved at the time. The FTC allowed those deals to move forward precisely because they didn't threaten competition. Also, the whole point of antitrust laws, at least what they say the whole point is, is to prevent companies from depriving customers of competition, resulting in higher prices. But Facebook is free! And the other thing that makes this blatant hypocrisy, the big whopping elephant in the room no one in the news media wants to talk about, pretty much each and every one of these 48 states puts monopoly limitations on cable and telco services, meaning that people in most places have at best a duopoly in the connection that gets them to Facebook to begin with. And yet, not one word is ever said in any lawsuit or antitrust action about that. It's blatant misdirection. The magician wants you focused on the coin in his hand, so you don't notice he just picked your pocket. And now, the FTC has shown themselves to be absolutely 100% on board with the deception. Which is how they got named this week's Biggest Bogan Emitter. I 
I want to tell you about the eyeglasses I've been wearing for years. As people can see on my videos, I have a very strong prescription, which makes glasses more expensive, especially when I need computer glasses, reading glasses, prescription sunglasses, and most expensively, progressive lenses for general everyday wear. To save money while still getting quality glasses, I get them from Fermu. In fact, I just got a pair of progressives with high-index aspherical lenses and a nice pair of frames my wife loves for just over $100. It would have been $500 to get them through my eye doctor. Not only do they look good, the glasses are durable. I've worn many pairs for several years without problems. All orders come with a 30-day return policy, a 3-month warranty, and one-on-one -on -one customer service. Go to Firmu, that's F-I-R-M-O-O dot Bogosity dot TV, anytime you need quality glasses at a low price. Once again, that's Firmu dot Bogosity dot TV. And now let's sacrifice this week's Idiot Extraordinary! And this week it goes to Reuters for a fact-checking article that needs some serious fact-checking of its own. Early in the history of the American colonies, Irish were kept as slaves, something on the order of 200,000 of them over a period of a century and a half. Modern-day negationists who apparently want you to think that black people were the only ones ever enslaved in the history of ever keep taking a denialist position on it from redefining their slavery to being indentured servitude to denying that it ever even happened. Although many Irish did come over to the Americas as indentured servants, a great number of them were Barbados. Yes, as in a past tense verb. That was the term. And if you search for it on the internet, you'll find plenty of sources confirming what I'm about to tell you. It refers to Irish forcibly captured, whether it was through a bogus legal conviction or even outright kidnapping, and sent to the colonies, Barbados in particular. This happened during a time of intense bigotry against Irish Catholics, especially under Oliver Cromwell. These were not indentured servants. They were kidnapped, having been given no choice in the matter, with no contract they could work off. By virtue of both heredity and upbringing, they were unable to endure the heat and intense conditions of the West Indies, and half of them died within five years. Ironically, the first blacks in the New World were indentured servants in mainland colonies such as Jamestown, and they did work off their contracts and became the first black landowners in the colonies. The situation reversed itself when it was found that black slaves purchased from the Asante Empire were much better able to withstand the heat and working conditions than those ginger little Irish folks. It actually didn't begin with that much bigotry. Although they probably did consider blacks to be inferior to whites, at least they weren't dirty, rotten, filthy Catholics. Racism against blacks developed over the course of the next hundred years or so, probably as a psychological justification for the enslavement and ill treatment which was only to get worse as time went on. Keeping Irish as slaves fell out of vogue. This is a nuanced view of history that just doesn't fly in our modern social justice postmodernist post-truth age, where, as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said, being morally right is more important than being factually correct. You have to go with the good fact, not the real fact. As if the enslavement of these Irish somehow de-emphasizes the horribleness of black slavery or something. They seem to think that if even a single white person were ever enslaved, it invalidates their entire worldview. Enter Reuters, who seem to want to imply that the whole thing was cooked up out of whole cloth in 2008. They're blaming what they call the Irish slaves meme on a single article from John Martin, quote, whose identity cannot be verified, as if that makes a difference somehow. Reuters cites a number of academics who call this racist ahistorical propaganda, but who don't seem to want to provide any actual facts of their own. Primarily, they seem to rely on an article published by Liam Hogan on Medium.com. There are just some bizarre things here. They talk about a proclamation of King James I in 1625, which required that Irish political prisoners be sent overseas and sold to English settlers. They say the claim is debunked by pointing out that James II wasn't born until 1633. Uh, what does the birth of James II have to do with a proclamation made by James I? 
There were horrific stories of Irish slaves being mistreated and Irish women being raped. They fact-checked this by quoting Hogan as calling it part radicalized sadomasochistic fantasy and part old white supremacist myth. But again, with Hogan himself providing absolutely no support for this whatsoever. Throughout, Reuters echoes what seems to be the main point Hogan keeps trying to make, which is that the only reason to even consider this history is because you're a racist. Because again, the existence of a single white slave at any point in history somehow diminishes the harms of black slavery. The fact is, a lot has been written about this prior to 2008, including facts about many Irish being Barbados against their will. Just to cite one source, because one is all I need to debunk it, there's the journal article A Riotous and Unruly Lot, published in the William & Mary Quarterly in October 1990, 18 years before Reuters gives any indication this claim ever existed. Reuters seems to want to debunk this by demanding levels of historical detail that were never entered into any official record. Their verdict is, quote, false. Facebook posts purporting to describe the origins of Irish slavery are a rehash of a 2008 article consisting of numerous false claims. When, again, there are numerous sources predating this that they never even bothered to mention, and neither they nor their sources present any facts contrary to the generally accepted history. They just think they can ignore any real fact that contradicts the good fact. So all of that makes Reuters this week's Idiot Extraordinaire. Well, that wraps up this Crime Doesn't Pay. Well, it paid a little. Edition of the Bogosity Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please keep this podcast going by subscribing and supporting at donate.bogosity.tv using PayPal or cryptocurrency or subscribe at Patreon or Subscribestar to listen early and ad-free. Also, please come to discord.bogosity.tv where you can join the discussion and post a question, statement, news article, or rant. Thank you for listening. This is the last regular podcast for 2020, but we'll be back from the holidays in the new year with our 2020 year in review, including our Idiot of the Year, followed by another year of podcasts in our 10th anniversary. Until then, here's a quote from B.W. Powell. We become slaves the moment we hand the keys to the definition of reality entirely over to someone else, whether it's a business, an economic theory, a political party, the White House, News World, or CNN. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution, not commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. Bogosity. We live in a world where light bulbs connect to the internet, and recent attacks on them prove that your online security is under threat like never before. Not only your websites, but the internet-enabled devices you buy. And the biggest problem is weak passwords. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords on the web and on your internet-enabled devices, all protected by one master password. LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers, all your computers, and even your mobile devices, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers, backup sensitive documents, software licenses, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications, manage passwords for your entire family, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now.